Well, this, this morning is an exceptional opportunity and a great pleasure to um, um, enjoy an, an interview with the Fluellings. Um, it reminds me of when I came back to Red Deer and one of my most difficult choices was trying to decide which Fluelling I would work with. Was it the museum or the library? And I decided that the um, museum was in more trouble than the library, so I should try and help the people at the museum. And of course, that was Morris. Um, Morris and Hazel are two of the best storytellers um, Red Deer has. And uh, today they will be um, enjoy <clears throat> and joining me and uh, telling you a few of them, a few highlights from their um, lives, lives which have many facets to them. So perhaps we could start, um, Morris, and uh, with how did you come to Red Deer? Um, I think you originally came from Muir or Tees, uh, Tees area, but you ended up in Red Deer for a lifetime and brought Hazel, of course, with you. That's right, Bob. Well, I came here first and I came here as a single man. Uh, Red Deer, I grew up in Muir, and Red Deer was the sort of the shopping center and the distribution center for all of central Alberta, as it always has been. And um, we loved to come to Red Deer, and it was a very beautiful city and uh, looked like a wonderful place to live. At the time I graduated from my first two years university, uh, the teacher shortage was critical in Alberta with the baby boom having generated all sorts of need in schools. Uh, this was translated into a teacher shortage. And that would be roughly when? It was 1962. And uh, I came here in the fall of 1962 to teach at Central. And indeed it was everything that I expected Red Deer to be. It was a delightful small city at that time in the 20,000s of people and um, uh, a, a wonderful school system. And, uh, and I came here in, as I said, in 62. I taught for a year and then went back to university, then went back and taught in Alex for a year and came back to Red Deer permanently in 65 and taught and eventually Hazel and I were married in 68 and she came right after we were married to also teach for the Red Deer public system. So you're a graduate teacher as well then Hazel? I am. Uh, in fact Morris and I met uh, at university and uh, I was in awe of this fellow. Um, I was in my first year and uh, he was in... I was finishing my fourth you year. You were finishing your fourth year. And uh, one of my roommates at university had taught with Morris. And uh, so she was telling me all sorts of wonderful things about him. And we used to have lunch together in the cafeteria and, and so on in those days. So you arrived in Red Deer and... Did you, you found it as you had as anticipated. It was a, a regional center um, with an agricultural base um, and was just getting, um, discovering oil and gas and not long afterwards would develop it out. Itself. The economy was very much on an upswing at that time. And, and Red Deer was growing and Red Deer was very vital at that time. It was a wonderful time. Um, do you want to then share a few stories about um, your early educational teaching period and perhaps even take us through a little longer to because uh, that's only a small part of your prior uh, prior to yeah prior to coming to Red Deer I spent a summer in Red Deer working at what we now know as Michener Center it was called the provincial training school in those days and that fit my training uh, well and gave me a taste of life in Red Deer, which really was the uh, impetus for coming back here to live. I came to, uh, to Red Deer, uh, this is how folksy things were. But the superintendent took a Saturday to interview people for new jobs, and so I had an appointment with uh, the superintendent, Harold Daw, on a Saturday. And uh, his secretary was also working that day, and he did a, a very brief interview, and he said, so would you like to come and teach in Red Deer? And uh, I said, yes, I would. And so he said to his secretary, 
would you write a letter of offer to Mr. Flewelling? So she went off and wrote a letter of offer. On a and, Saturday. On a Saturday and brought it to me. I read it and he said, what do you think? And I said, I'd, I'd, I'd accept this offer. So he said, would you type a letter of acceptance from, his, from Mr. Flewelling for this job? And so I signed the letter of acceptance. And this was, this was the informality that was a kind of a hallmark of times that were very different from today. And then I mentioned earlier that when we were married in, on August the 24th, which is the end of the summer and the beginning of the school year, uh, Hazel was teaching at the Glen Rose School Hospital the previous year. She applied to come to Red Deer knowing that she was going to be living here. And Harold Daw hired her sight unseen and uninterviewed to teach on the basis that she was coming to live in Red Deer as my wife. <laughs> and so this is very different from today. Well, yes, because parts of Canada were, uh, had the opposite rule, and that is uh, to share jobs, uh, there can only be one teacher in the family. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, teaching here in, in the mid-60s meant that I was teaching here during the Canada Centennial. And there were Centennial projects like the beautiful mural that, that the kids made uh, in, in, at Central Junior High. And it was also the genesis of the new building of Central Junior High. The new, the new, well, we call it, I call it the new building. It's the current building for Central Junior High. Because previous to that, we were in the adjacent building. And the secretary that you referred to, of course, is the well-known Lowell Scott. Absolutely. Um, who was secretary for almost as long as Harold was the superintendent. And when she left, it took three people to fill her job because she had grown up with the job and she knew every nook and cranny in the entire system. But anybody new coming in was faced with a learning curve that was momentous. And it, as I say, it took three people to fill Lil's position. Would you like to share some of your memories or memorable highlights uh, from your days as a teacher and perhaps uh, uh, Hazelwood as well. Why don't you tell uh, about uh, signing in on the Red Deer School District and their condition under which you had to sign in? Well, I had, uh, I had grown up um, uh, just south of Panoka, so I knew Red Deer as the, the city to go to. It was uh, it was familiar to me. I had, uh, actually, I had gone to, I had taken a semester at Lindsay Thurber uh, because my, I didn't really know what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. And um, so it was felt uh, by my parents that I needed to uh, raise uh, a couple of my marks. Uh, high school marks. So I came down to Red Deer for one semester and then my father uh, being European said, you know, I think you're still rather immature to go to university. And he said, you also need a trade. And I looked at him in disbelief because here I'd raised my marks to make sure that I could get into whatever faculty I wanted at university. He said, no, you need a trade first. And I looked at him again and said, really? And he said, yes, I think you need to go to secretarial school. So I drove to Red Deer every day um, to uh, attend uh, Key Secretarial School run by Mary Brinton. And uh, that was a very wise choice because it served me well. It served me well when I went to university, and it served me well as a teacher. So, when I came to Red Deer, I was known as Morris's wife. I didn't have, I, I didn't have a name anymore other than Morris's wife, and uh, I, I wasn't interviewed uh, for a job. I did uh, go in and meet with Mr. Daw and uh, he handed me a letter 
uh, to, I read this letter, and I can't believe today that I signed it, because it was an agreement uh, saying that I wouldn't become pregnant during the school term. And I swallowed hard and thought, I really need to be able to teach, so I signed it. And I was assigned to uh, teach at G.W. Smith uh, with Alice Hogan as principal, and it was a wonderful experience. But it was right from uh, a very, very short honeymoon at uh, Pigeon Lake to teaching for Red Deer Public. And uh, it meant, it meant that um, neither one of us were very far from our parents, so uh, we had parental support. And uh, it was a, a whole new beginning. And Morris had always promised me, when he, he proposed to me, he said, well, he said, I don't aspire ever to be a millionaire, but he said, I can promise you this, you'll never be bored. <laughs> and I haven't been. <laughs> never borrowed. He always had several pots on the stove, and they were all on boil. <laughs> Hazel had the opportunity and he had the energy to go with it. Oh. Hazel had the opportunity to work under the leadership of Alice Hogan, oh. Alice Olson, and she married the oh. city commissioner, Calm Hogan. So she Alice Hogan. And Alice was a way before her time. And uh, she had a, a system whereby they did academics in the morning and arts and culture in the afternoon in the schools. And Hazel was involved in dramatic productions and puppet shows and all sorts of things like that. And then Alice went on in her later years that um, she spearheaded a, a program to plant trees in Red Deer in, uh, in a program called Trees for 2000. And uh, so there were hundreds of trees planted by volunteers in the city here. I remember also that she said to uh, the school district, we won't plant any trees in the schoolyard until you give us a fence, because it's pointless to have trees if you don't have a fence. And if you look at the schoolyard today at G.W. Smith, there are yeah. towering trees um, uh, there. But uh, she was she was a very advanced, and of course, she and Mary Morrison were the two women principals, and women principals were very, very rare creatures in those days. And Alice just happened to be chairman of the library board. <laughs> Small town Red Deer. Small, Small town, Red Deer. town Red Deer. And Red Deer was very welcoming to me. It was very important that Morris's wife come and join us and meet us and come for dinner. And and that led also to the University of Alberta Alumni Association, the Red Deer Branch, because that was a welcoming from alumni, some of whom we knew at university, people like Jim Foster, and uh, and so on. And the the organization was very active in those days, and it was tied in with the development of Red Deer College and the library at Red Deer College. My um teachers in grade uh, six were Alice Olson and Harold Daw, <laughs> half and half. <laughs> we, we anticipated that, that that relationship would get even closer, but discovered a year later that it didn't. <laughs> um, are there any other, um, in those early years of teaching in Red Deer, that uh, experiences that um, have a long-lasting um, effect? Well, on for, for me, I went on uh, to teach for a few years in in Central, enjoying the uh, the um, junior high level of, of kids. But I realized at one point that I was teaching courses rather than children because I was losing track of of individuals because I saw so many kids every week. We did a rotary teaching system where I would see over 400 students a week. And, and so I went to Mr. Daw and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Find me something else to do. And so he arranged that I became a guidance counselor 
for the three junior high schools at the time, Eastview, Central, and West Park. And I did that, but then, under the leadership of the late Dr. Don Hepburn, who was the special education uh, consultant. consultant for the system, he developed two programs, both of which Hazel and I got involved in. Uh, the one for me was the Junior High Alternative Program, and it was a program that he designed for students who refused to attend school or the school refused to have. And so we had a rented downtown office space, and I was the person in charge of that program for both academics, life skills, and uh, work experience. And this was all at the initiative of the social credit government looking for ideas as to how to um, diversify, diversify education and keep kids in school. So Don asked me if I would like to take on that program, and I did that for the last eight years of my teaching career. And I can tell you that working with the kids in that program, downtown in that office, uh, as were really, really some of the most important teaching work I ever did. I had between 10 and 20 students between the ages of 12 and 20 years old. And it was an arranged uh, assortment of people with learning difficulties, uh, home difficulties. Very often the youngest child in a family with elderly parents and so on. So it was very much a program of salvaging people and maybe getting them back into the school system. And Hazel did another program, and I think you should talk about the uh, challenge program because it was a matching program, but it was to enrich teaching and learning for grade four and five students. And uh, uh, we had uh, our first son uh, was adopted uh, in 1969, and uh, so this meant that there was a major shift in uh, my teaching. And um, so um, I did some contract uh, work um, in the development of the challenge program, and we would uh, take uh, and do assessment of all of the grade four and five students in the public school district from all of the schools and then we would look at the top two percent of uh, scores and we would go from there and select these children uh, to be pulled out of their regular classroom one half day a week uh, for ten weeks and these were the very and these, bright students. these were very very bright uh, students, and this uh, turned out to be an absolutely wonderful program because we worked closely with the parents, and uh, we encouraged the children uh, again uh, to have a clipboard and a string and a pen preferable to a pencil because a pencil would break and we had to make notes and uh, the children I would develop um, oh 10 or 12 different probably 12 or 15 possible areas of study and then the students would actually choose which area of study they wanted to learn more about and uh, we did one on, we would offer one on the oil and gas industry. And we would go out, I would have maximum 10 kids, 10 students, and I had a van uh, that I drove, and uh, usually a parent would accompany us, and we would visit a gas plant. They would learn all about sulfur and how sulfur was produced and how it was used. Uh, we actually had a group of students that would go up to Fort McMurray, uh, Suncor, in the early, early days. 
And the students then would come back to their classroom and they would talk about what they had seen and what they had learned. And uh, this was where I got involved uh, with Musquachis, uh, formerly known as Hobima, and it was through Ethel Taylor. Dr. Ethel Taylor. I said to her, I had, uh, I knew she had contacts at uh, Musquachis, and I said, Ethel, I want to set up uh, a program uh, with the Indigenous children at Herman Skin School, and you're going to open the door for me. And she did, and she introduced me uh, to Dr. Teresa Wildcat. And uh, it gives me shivers when I share this with you, uh, because um, Teresa had gone to the convent school here in Red Deer. And uh, it took her a long time to get the grade 12 marks to go to university. And Teresa became a teacher. And uh, so, bless her heart, she, uh, she made arrangements to have 10 students from Ermanskin School meet up with 10 children from Red Deer Public. And these children met one afternoon a week, every week for 10 weeks, and they learned Cree syllabics. They learned that although the houses were decorated differently, they were pretty much like our houses in Red Deer. And the students were so observant. Um, and I remember our, uh, our son uh, going up to Musquachis and he, we arrived and he would have been probably four years old and because he could go with me then and we arrived at the old dance hall that I had known uh, when I was growing up at Musquachis and that was Musquachis Cultural College and we pulled in and the, the boys and girls that had come up from Red Deer said well there had been talk as we arrived. Well, who would go with Mrs. Wildcat and who would travel with me? And we had, an, at that time, uh, we weren't using a van, we were using our old blazer truck. And there were some of the more brave students said, oh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll go with Mrs. Wildcat. But then there were those that were reluctant. And, they wanted to stay, stay close to me. Well, Mrs. Wildcat pulled in in her Chrysler New Yorker, and the mouths dropped. They looked at my old truck, and they looked at Mrs. Wildcat's car. They all go with her. And they all wanted to go with her, and, my, and our older son uh, said, uh, he, we were talking, and, and I introduced him to Mrs. Wildcat. And he said, Mom, where are all the Indians? <laughs> and Teresa reached down to him and put her arms around him and she said, Sweetheart, I am an Indian. And he said, You are? And there was disbelief. And it was one of the most wonderful experiences when our children went for the first time into Urban Skin School their mouths just dropped because there were floor-to-ceiling murals of indigenous heroes. And our students said, how come we don't have any heroes in Red Deer? And I said, well, actually, we do. Well, why aren't they in our schools? And these were grade, and four, grade four and five students. And the bet, observations they made. You better also talk about the uh, the discovery the young fellow made on the way home when he was peeling the orange oh. quickly. Well, I had this this young man. Um, 
in class and he was we had had a really busy day. We had gone to Teresa's sister in law sister's home in uh, Musquatees and it had been wonderful. The children had made bannock. We'd had bannock, we had played games outdoors, uh, indigenous games, and our students had had a wonderful time. And this one boy was sitting in uh, the passenger seat beside me and he was very, very carefully peeling an orange and he was extremely quiet. And the other children were talking, but not this lad. His name was David. Anyway, he was. I said to him, David, you're very quiet. Are you all right? And he said, I'm thinking. And I said, well, uh, do you want to share what you're thinking? And he, again, he was very quiet. And he, I said to him, probably, probably the other kids are thinking as well, but they're sharing what they're thinking. And he, I said, so what's up? And he said, well, I'm embarrassed. And I said, what are you embarrassed about? Can you share that? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. And he was struggling. And I said, well, remember, what's talked about in the truck doesn't have to go any further than the truck. But maybe we should talk about it. And I said, what are you embarrassed about? And he said, I thought it would be dirty. And I said, and was it? He said, no. And I said, what troubles you? And he said, well, if I was wrong about that, I'm probably wrong about a lot of stuff. And I said, oh, David, that's part of growing up. As you grow up and grow older, you need to experience life. And as you experience life, you will discover new information. And you think about that, and then your ideas change. That's how we learn. And so we talked about that. I said, so. How many of the rest of you thought it might be dirty? And a number of them chirped up and said yes. And I said, and where did we get that idea from? Well, then they started talking. I didn't get it from home. How did I have, how did I get that idea? They talked about it at school. And they said, well, where do we get ideas like that from? They talked about uh, television. They, they said, well, is it movies? And we talked about, well, 19th century indigenous people. And they said, and we used to play cowboys and Indians. What's that all about? And I said, exactly. And what did you discover? And he said, their house was pretty much like ours. They had a dog and a cat. And we had grape Kool-Aid and we had brownies. And it, it was just like ours. It was decorated differently. But it's pretty much the same. And these were, you know, these were major leaps for very young kids, nine and ten years old. But they, we, we, we had a, another delightful experience. I had a little girl who was very, very good with her hands, very quick. And uh, Teresa's mother, Emma Mind, uh, whose husband had been the chief at Musquatchies in the earlier days. And we were doing beadwork. We had made looms and we were doing traditional beadwork and making little leather pouches for the boys and little change purses for the girls. And this girl was done always first. She was just, had wonderful dexterity. Anyway, she showed her project to me, and I said, oh, that's very good. You might want to take it over to Mrs. Mind and see what suggestions she would have with respect to improving your project. 
So she took it over to Mrs. Mine, and Mrs. Mine turned it upside down, of course, and looked at the back side of the project and the beading. And she made some suggestions. And then Mrs. Mine turned to her daughter, Teresa Wildcat, and she said very quietly, but audibly, she's very bright for a white child. And then she realized what she had said, and <laughs> the dear woman covered her face in embarrassment. And so the three of us had our arms around one another, and I said, oh, we only bring our best. <laughs> but it was those sort of barriers that dropped, and it was just a matter of, you know what? We're learning about one another, and we're looking at our similarities, not our differences. And it was just, it was a happy place. And that gave us an introduction to Masquiches, as Hazel said, through Ethel Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I became active with uh, the board of Masquiches Cultural College, and Austin Willis, the broadcaster, was on the board. He was retired and living in Wetaskiwin at the time. And we were looking to raise funds to do development work because there were no buildings really um, of any note at all that were uh, given to the cultural college to develop. They were just simply using the old dance hall and, and some of the other, other school areas. And Hazel was involved with Ethel in getting uh, rounding up books from library discards and from our university friends and so on to help develop the, the Masquiches Cultural College Library. And the Cultural College now, of course, today is, is going well. But it was those early things that, that were involved in and gave me the, uh, a, re a real boost in wanting to uh, assist the indigenous people. Well, Muscatrice Cultural College at that time was housed initially in the old dance hall, and we had to wear rubber boots. Because the floors were wet. Because, because uh, the water in the springtime was, was quite deep, and Ethel and I had hauled bricks uh, from Red Deer, from the brickyard, uh, bricks and boards to make uh, library shelving for old university texts. Uh, I can't believe we and did that. And public library discards. And then, and then um, Ethel was on the public library board and uh, we used to give our discarded books uh, to the local bookseller. Well, Ethel needed support to change that. So then we took our discards up to Musquiches, uh for uh, their first library. See, in, in the challenge program, Hazel's mentioned the oil and gas industry and Masquiches, but she also did one on the beef industry. Yes. And what were some of the other ones? Oh, that, the that beef, beef industry and then um, Pioneer History, again, with working at the museum. Um, Soap making and things and like candy. Making candy. Making candy. Oh yeah, the um, candy making. And then, um, oh goodness, some of the other ones I'm trying. Oh, rocketry. Uh, we did one on rocketry, again involving some of the instructors uh, from Red Deer College. Um, Andy Schmidt did a session on uh, astronomy. Yeah, these are all for... Um, These grade class, five grade kids. Five, grade, oh. uh, yeah, grade. Oh, you're, you're special students in Red yes. Deer. Yeah. yeah. Grade four. And then Hazel, Hazel went on. You, you asked me about my special you know, moments in teaching, but then Hazel went on after this when our children were very small, and she went back to more regular teaching. And as I had developed the alternative junior high school program, Hazel was called upon to develop the senior high school program alternative program. It was called the Outreach Program. And she operated the Outreach Program for grades 10, 11, and 12 age students for several years, yeah. and also developed at a different time uh, a school for young offenders within the Remand Center. 
So Hazel spent about five years doing... In jail. Yeah, in, in that. Going to jail every day. Not, not to be offended, uh, how did that experience go? Actually, um, I never had as uh, a tent of a group <laughs> uh, freedom to teach. I had a wonderfully supportive director at the Remand Center, and um, I was given free reign to develop programming. We used distance ed um, materials as much as we could. But again, I had a number of students um, that had uh, some issues with fetal alcohol. And uh, again, um, we had to make, we had to make do and develop our own program, really, for these students. But um, it was wonderful. The students did really, really well. In fact, uh, they would go out, they would be released, and unfortunately uh, do get into some mischief so they could come back to school. That was one of our issues. <laughs> and I, I would say, now, which school, to which school, would you like me to send your books? Oh, don't bother. And then they would be released, and then they would go out, and do a break and enter, and then they'd be back the next day. So we would have a chat about this, that uh, perhaps they should give up uh, break and enters because they weren't good at it, because they always got caught. And um, again, I would... Uh, my students, when they were in the remand center, of course, had were well fed. Uh, they were looked after, they were kept clean and tidy. Uh, they went to bed at regular hours, so they were rested. And they wanted to come to school. And I would go into the classroom, and they would stand up when I came in. I mean, I had never been treated as well. Um, you also developed a, a library within the oh, Remand yes. Center. We, the Remand Center allowed me to set up a library, and uh, that was a, a great, a wonderful experience. Um, unfortunate, well, I had, it was a learning experience for me. I learned a lot. Um, one, I um, ended up with uh, one of the young offenders that had broken into my house. And um, I didn't realize that. At Christmas time, Morris and I would do, make stockings, Christmas stockings, uh, for all of the uh, young offenders for on their doorknobs, so they would have something on Christmas morning. And I went in. We had been baking cookies at the Remand Center I was, it was part of the math curriculum and measurement. Count, count your cookies before they're eaten. <laughs> yes. And learning about fractions in those days. And uh, so we were making up baskets of baking. And um, I had left my mixette up at the, um, at the remand center in my classroom. And uh, I went up to fetch it for use, home use, and there was a, a new a new admission, and I knelt down beside this young fellow, and I said, introduced myself, and uh, said that uh, would he be there um, following Christmas break, and he nodded his head and said yes, he thought he'd be in there for quite a, quite a long time, and uh, then Later on, I discovered he was one of the fellows that broke into our house. And um, the director uh, asked me if I'd like to have him moved. And I thought about that, and I was, I was still quite angry. And I said, no, I think I'd like him to face me every day in the classroom. And this, he was, he was there for seven months, it turned out. Anyway, this young fellow would have, would have a fit of sobbing 
uh, usually most during one part of the day at least. And finally I kept him in for a few minutes and I said, you know, this is very difficult for both of us. But we need, we need to be able to resolve this situation. And I said, how can I help you? And he said, you can stop being so nice to me. And I said, do you have any idea how hard it is for me to be nice to you? I want to kick you in the shins. I am so angry with what you did. And uh, we managed. We managed to finally sort that out. And uh, years later, he phoned me. He had married. He had children. He was living in BC. And he said, and I'm being a good boy. <laughs> oh, I love lovely story. Um, but it's a little close to home. <laughs> when I think of the last part of it. Yeah. Um, Morris, you then went from teaching and education to another um, you know, it turned out to be a significant portion of your life and the community of Red Deer's life. Uh, I made I made a mid-career change. Uh, I'd been uh, active as a volunteer all my life in in history and heritage and museums and so on. And uh, I was on city council at the same time from 1974 to 1977. And... Uh, uh, in in the early 70s, City Council decided that the 60th anniversary of the city was coming up in 1973 and that they should have a project that they could identify the 60th anniversary. So I was asked if I would call together a committee in the community and and give a recommendation to City Council as to what might be a 60th anniversary project. One of the committee members was uh, the late Gene Daw. And uh, Gene came to the committee with the idea that we needed a museum. That in 1967, a great deal of historical information and historical nostalgia had been aroused with the Canadian Centennial. And many communities had produced a history book and many mu communities had indeed launched a museum. But Red Deer hadn't. We had no museum. And so it was agreed that uh, uh, this recommendation would go to council and council indeed approved it. So the official City of Red Deer project for the 60th anniversary in 1973 would be the museum, the founding of a museum. So with that, a museum society was formed and, uh, and a temporary museum was started in the basement of the new wing of the recreation center, which is the north wing of the current recreation center. The basement space was, was built and finished, but it, was, it didn't have a use. And it had a ramp into it, uh, as well as stairways. So uh, it was deemed to be a, a good place to, uh, to start the museum. So we had the formation of a museum society and they started a museum. We had the opening in uh, 1973. Uh, then Governor General Michener came as the uh, dignitary to open the, the museum when he was on one of his personal visits to Red Deer as Governor General. And uh, we operated there, but we immediately turned our attention to uh, developing a new facility. And so uh, that became the, the, the real work of the, the Museum Society. So for several years, we reviewed plans and began raising money. And both Hazel and I were involved in the, the project to raise the money for the new building. And, uh, and finally, uh, we, were, we were on the eve of getting ready for um, moving into the new building in, in late 19... 76, seven, pardon me, I was retiring from council and they were in need of a new director for the museum. And uh, we'd had some troubles on the museum board and, and uh, as chairman of the board, I was, 
a little sensitive to that. Anyway, the board called a meeting one day at lunch uh, for, for a lunch hour meeting in a private home, and I thought, oh my goodness, what's going on now? Uh, that we'd be meeting in a private home at lunchtime with a meeting called by the members of the board, not by the chairman of the board. And it was at that meeting that the board invited me to apply for the job as director. And I said, look, I've got a teaching job. I have two little kids. I can't make a mid-career change and have my salary drop. And they said, oh, let us worry about that. And so I have to tell you that because I went on to continue my career as director of the museum at the same salary I would have if I had been teaching school. And that was unheard of in the museum world. I was the highest paid museum director of any community museum in Canada. And so I became the director on January the 1st, 77, 78, and we moved into the new building on April the 1st, 1978, opened to the public in June and had the official opening in October uh, with uh, um, Lieutenant Governor Steiner came for the official opening. And uh, that started for me a 19-year career change from being a, in public education to being in history and heritage director of the museum. And it was a very, very wonderful time that, uh, that I was director of the museum. Are there some highlights from that? Oh. So I certainly remember a few when I was very much chairman so. of your board. Very much so. Um, the, I think one of the very first highlights for me was that we had just settled into the new museum, into the new building. We moved the collections from one building to the adjacent building. And um, um, I got a letter from the Canadian Museums Association to say that on the basis of the building, which had been built to National Museum standards, and included a National Exhibition Center, the collection quality, the staffing and the program that the museum had been identified as the model museum for its size in Canada. Now that was quite an honor for that our young museum to have. And it was well earned. Um, the collections had grown and were absolutely superb. Um, I just throw in now that Ultimately, the clothing and textile collection at the museum here is the fourth largest and most important public textile museum in Canada today. We have the Swallow Collection, which is a very, very wonderful exotic collection of Eskimo and um, uh, Northern Indigenous artworks. Uh, yeah, the military collection is superb. And for example, we have the only prisoner of war uniform that exists in Canada out of all that we had during the Second World War. Prisoner of war camp in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat and all the internment camps in Kananaskis and Castle Mountain. All of that, there's only one uniform that's left and it's at the museum here. So, uh, those are those are real highlights. I think the highlight exhibit in my time at the museum was an exhibit on indigenous life of the plains people before the advent of the horse. In other words, the dog was the beast of burden. And it was called Where the Old Man Slept. And the piece of that that was so important was that it was the first exhibit in Canada where the labels for the exhibit were in English, French, and Cree syllabics. So that was done again with the help of the people from Masquiches. They took our labels and translated them into acceptable Cree and into the syllabics. So it was a, a, a very wonderful, wonderful piece. So, and, and the museum was very uh, successful in its, in its, programming and so on. We went through two expansions to add additional space to the museum and we were joined by the archives when the 
uh, library was being redeveloped, the archives had been housed in the library's unused elevator shaft. So when the library was being built and the elevator was being added, they needed the space. So the archives moved in with the, the museum and it was a, a very reasonable and happy uh, union of the two heritage forces. So those were, those were a couple of the highlights uh, from, uh, from the history. But that gets us tangled up then with the, the, um, the expansion of the library in 1967 because um, when, the city, when the city wanted to have a centennial project, they asked the citizens of Red Deer, what should we have as a centennial project? So the public library, as people know it today, was built. It was called the Centennial Library, and it moved the library from the second floor of the current city hall. The east side of the second floor of the city hall had been the library space. It moved into the new building. But there was a controversy as to where this new library would be built. Would it be built where it was, or would it be built on what is now the museum site? because both of those were city-owned properties. And um, the late Charlie Snell, who was a, an early surveyor in Red Deer and whose wife, Mabel Besant, worked in the library, was very much concerned that the library be located in the very heart of the downtown. And so he and Mrs. Besant gave $50,000 to the city on condition that the library would be built downtown and not on the museum site. And that's why the, the basement meeting room in the library is called the Snell Gallery in honor of that gift. It was also closer to their home, which uh, yes. of course is where the courthouse <laughs> now is. And, yes. and their home yes. was not preserved like we've managed to do with the Parsons house, uh, and so, the corner from it. That's right. and so. That formed the genesis for the, the, the museum was the 60th anniversary of the city project. The public library was the uh, centennial of, of, the, the, uh, of Canada, was the city's centennial project. And it was uh, one floor in a basement. And subsequently, uh, they were going to expand the library. I should be letting you floor. tell no, this. No, no, the second floor in the library and that debate was, would we put the second floor on the library or would we build a new swimming pool in town? And so that became a bit of a political football. And Norman and uh, the late Norman and Iva Bauer decided that it was, it was bad business to have the community dividing on this issue. Both facilities were needed. So they gave a huge gift to the public library to ensure that the second floor was built on the public library and the pool was built at the Daw Center, which is another whole story of education leadership in, in Alberta, where Red Deer led the way in developing a community school with the recreation facilities of gymnasium and a rink and a swimming pool and a branch of the public library, and a Catholic school, and a public school, and an RCMP precinct, and a health unit office, all in one building. And that- And now, and now they're substantially expanding it. To, right, and that building, that <clears throat> concept of the community school was developed by a number of people and agencies in the community but the part that I remember so much about it was, I was asked by the school board chairman, Francis Craigie, if I would be the spokesperson for the project to convince the legislature in Edmonton. And so I met, we met with four ministers in the Carillon room and I extolled the virtues of the community school and the province bought it and provided additional funding for the project. Eventually it, it changed, but that was the genesis. So anyway, back to the second floor I'll, of the I'll, library. I'll, I'll just intercede that um, this week, um, a book called Pathways to Education um, in Red Deer 
is um, is coming out. Um, look forward to seeing a copy of it in your hands, particularly since you wrote the introduction to it. But it does pick up some of those uh, some of those some of those stories. very early threads. Red Deer was a leader in education with the community schools that had been a leader decades before in the trimester high school system and in the uh, and in the initiation of Red Deer College as an academic feeder to the University of Alberta. So, I mean, that tradition of educational excellence and exploration, the alternative junior high school program was the first alternative school in Alberta. Alberta has hundreds of them now, but it was the, the very first. Your outreach was right out there with the uh, and your remand center school was, they were very, 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 very early. Anyway, I've moved away from the library, but I think while we're building the library, we have the Centennial first floor, we have the Bauer second floor, and then we were running out of room because Red Deer was growing apace. So the, the plan was developed by the library board to take the 1913 armory, which at that time was being used as a fire hall downtown to become annexed to the library next door because you've got the city hall, the armory, and the library all on that corner of, of City Hall Park. So the plan was to build a link to connect the Centennial Library to the 1913 armory and Hazel was chairman of the library board, and although there was a moratorium on capital program building in the city, they managed to build the public library addition, which provided an adaptive reuse of a heritage building, which was now an abandoned fire hall and had been an armory to begin with, uh, with the uh, building expansion at two thirds of the cost of new construction if they'd knocked down the, the, the armory and brought the children's department out of the basement of the library into this wonderful new space of an armory. And so Hazel and her henchmen raised, what, 1.3 million? 2.5 million. 2.5 million uh, to, to fund that. Hazel is working full time at the remand center and the remand people are coming to work for her in the in the weekends because for four years, Hazel and her trusty band of volunteers ran what was called the Fire Hall Fun Factory, which was a, a community activity center to raise money for the new library and to put this put a use to the library bill uh, the the armory building which had been abandoned by the by the by the uh, firefighters and there's a million stories about the tea room that hazel operated with volunteers and the work of the remand center people on weekends helping with painting and carpentry work and so on they were fabulous and and all of the activities that went on there including small symphony concerts and and book concerts sales. and book sales and everything and ultimately in 1994 opened the link and the children's library. And that was all located there because of the Snells and the museum was located where it is because that was the major gift of the city to the museum's building project to, to get started with the, the site. And uh, right after we announced the museum was going to be uh, the 60th anniversary project, the Chamber of Commerce had built up a purse of $100,000 plus and they, from a lottery that they were operating over the years, and they didn't know how to get rid of the proceeds because whenever they thought of a way to fund something in the community, it was offensive to another part of the community. So the part that was considered to be least offensive was to give the money to the museum. So as soon as the funding program was started for the museum, the, uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce quickly came in with a $100,000 gift. And then Molly Bannister and Walter Code were the fundraising co-chairs with a band of people like 
Hazel and Maddie McCullough and Jim Foster and your mother and so many people raising money to raise the million dollars that it took to raise, to build and furnish the building. And that, that's the... Um... That was the, that's the existing uh, first part of the museum that opened in 1978. And then three years later, we added galleries and storage space to the north side. And then when the library, when the archives outgrew its space, together with them, we, we added a large piece on the north east or the southeast corner which became the library and further storage areas so when, when you finished um, um, as I recall the uh, library gained a new reputation for the quality of its <clears throat> massing or its design um, which um, led to a, an award I think that came out of out of England as as the most boring uh, building in the oh, world. The most boring postcard. <laughs> that that was that was a real wonderful story out of the uh, out of uh, in my time at the museum. It was the world's most boring postcard, and it was a bit of a spoof at the beginning. But we decided that we would take this spoof and make it into a a real story, and uh, it would be. Uh, I think superfluous to tell the details of how it came. Anyway, a letter had come from a London police precinct office to announce that every year they have a contest at the precinct for their officers to go out on their summer holidays and bring back pictures from the places they visited. And they they have a contest within the precinct to pick the world, the most boring postcard. And the postcard that happened to get into that contest, phony contest in England, was one of the front of our museum, which was pretty boring. <laughs> and so we were, we were advised that we had won that honor uh, for that particular year. And I eventually found out how it all came to happen. But what I did do was I thought, well, we'll parlay this into something interesting. So I phoned CBC as it happens. And I said, we have been identified as having the world's most boring postcard. And within, I phoned them in the morning. And that evening, it was on the show. They'd interviewed the people in England. They'd interviewed us. They had the story. And it was, it was just rollicking. And so... People said, well, what are you going to do with those postcards? And I said, well, they're now identified as a limited edition. So we numbered them all and we sold them instead of 25 cents a piece, we sold them for $1.25 and we raised enough money to buy the first computer for the museum. <laughs> Not only that, but um, a morning show, I can't remember the name of it, in a CBC television morning show, contacted me and said, would I be uh, a guest on their show about the world's most boring postcard? And I said, sure. So I was going to, to uh, Toronto and Ottawa to a meeting, so we arranged my television interview to be, to be at that time. And they just wanted to hear about the story and ta tell about the story. And then they instituted a contest with CBC to have Canada's most boring postcard. And then the finale to the whole thing was on New Year's, CBC was doing a wrap up of the best stories from 19, whatever it was. And they said the best human interest story for that year was Red Deer's most boring postcard. <laughs> so it kept, it kept reappearing oh, yeah. all the way on down. Then, much to my great chagrin, somewhere along the line, somebody decided that the elm tree that was the focus of the, of the picture in front of the museum had to be cut down. I can't remember why it had to be cut down. And I was scandalized at this and, and was powerless to, to do anything because the tree was gone. And a, a young fellow in town here said, relax, I have a tree that you can have. And he arranged for having the current elm tree 
that's there as a replacement. And the tree had been dedicated to the memory of, uh, I think, Agnes Richards, who was one of the founders of the archives. There was a plaque on it. And, and I said, to cut down a tree that was a memorial tree was outrageous anyway. We won't go into my peak and fit that I went into, but he did come up with a, a tree to replace it. I, thought that, I think that's where I learned an expression from you called trees of renown. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another Red Deer based story. Um, and when um, that uh, era in your life finished uh, or came to an end, uh, where did you go after that? Well, it came to an end rather early for most people because I started my teaching career rather early. So I was 55 and I was able to retire at that point. And that was in 1996, I believe. And uh, I retired to go back on city council because I had promised that I couldn't do city council when I had a full-time job in young family and so on, but that I would come back. So I came back onto council in the election of 1996 or seven. And so that gave me uh, a sort of a, a connection and then Hazel and I started a small ranch out at Pine Lake. And so I had a small cattle herd and um, trained some horses and, and did some, uh, some of that sort of thing, as well as being a member of city council. And it was at that time that you had to go and get the keys from city council when the bull got out. <laughs> yes. and, uh, and, and so um, I was on council for three terms and then Gail Sirkan, who was the mayor, announced she was retiring. And I said, and people started pointing their finger at me saying, well, you will run for mayor. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm retired. I'm too old. I don't want to do that just now. But ultimately, in 2004, I was elected mayor in that election. And I did three terms as mayor, total of nine years. And again, um, Highlights of that time were, uh, the, the biggest highlight was the uh, um, mending the rift between the county and the city over tax and land base and, and um, annexations and so on. There had been a great deal of, of acrimony between the county council and the city council, both in the press and out of the press and, and so on. So it was, it was a very bitter time. And it was very restricting for the city because every file you touched had some relationship to the county and the answer would always be no. And we'd run out of uh, service industrial land. We were nearly running out of um, residential land potential for development and so we were hemmed in by the county like a donut and uh, and so with great um, a great deal of, of cooperation and leadership from the planning people the county and the city councils we managed to to solve this with a program called the intermunicipal development plan where there was a band around the city that was for any development, it was being controlled both by the city and by the county. And it was a first in, in Alberta, and it led the way in, in city-county uh, relationships. That was the biggest, the biggest thing. The other big issue in my day as mayor, right from the get-go, was dealing with the homelessness and the addiction issues uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our city. And we led the country. At one point, we were the first city, we were the first municipality in Canada to get federal funding uh, in a new funding program. The feds had had withdrawn from housing completely in 1994. And so there was housing shortage buildup. And there were the other social issues that followed that created the great homelessness problem. And so Red Deer studied it for a couple of years. We adopted the housing 
first program, which was a program developed by Philip Mangano in the United States at the request of Ronald Reagan. And it was a, a rapid housing program for supportive living for, for people who were, were homeless. And we made great strides with that in the next few years where we developed uh, supportive housing and, uh, and reduced the, uh, the homelessness issue. Those were the really big ones. The development of the civic yards, the new civic yards down uh, on, on the, the river was a big one. The biggest disaster during my time was the Father's Day flood in 1995. That was a very, very scary time where we had the flooding of the Red Deer River to a height that had not been seen in a, in a century and very nearly threatened the downtown with complete uh, being completely awash. It didn't happen, and it was a, practically a miracle that was, it didn't. Was that after the Dixon Dam? Or? Yeah, no, the Dixon Dam was in place long before this. Uh, the, uh, the issue was that we had days and days and days of intensive and heavy rain in the West Country, and we were at the height of the um, snow melt partly because of the rain, partly because of the warm temperatures. And the river just rose, and it was a raging torrent. And uh, and the, um, the situation was that I was told by the river engineer people that the river would rise a meter and a half. And it was already, at that time, at the bottom of all the bridges. It, there, there was no room under the bridges at all. The water was just barely getting under it. And, and trees were coming down the, the, the river. And I was told that the river was slated to rise another meter and a half and that that would put the water at the lower steps of City Hall. That's where the flood would come. So everything in the, in the downtown had to be evacuated below, below uh, ground because we knew that any parkades or anything like that would all be flooded. All basements would be flooded. So it was a terrifying time. June the 12th or something, Father's Day, I remember it. And uh, we watched the river and it didn't come up and it didn't come up any further and it didn't come up any further. And we were wondering why, when they said the crest is yet to come, what was delaying the crest? And what had actually happened was that the Little Red, which is a tributary uh, to the Red Deer River just, just west of here, it was pouring tons of water into the river, and it was in such an outrage that it had torn the banks of its own river course and sent the trees down, and it was, it was, it was really the source of much of the potential flood but it tore out so many trees in its own water course that it dammed its outlet into the Red Deer River. And that damming backed up the Little Red and flooded the land behind the Little Red, but it also allowed the worst of the flood water to come down the Red Deer Channel. And then when the Little Red Deer Dam broke and came in, the red deer had already gone down, so we never did get that meter and a half additional crest. And it was simply that we had this dam form on the Little Red, or we would have we would have got it, and all of downtown on the flat would have been flooded. Red, red deer has always been a well. It, it comes from having being the site of the crossing. That's right. Calgary and Edmonton. Um, so it's always been, a, the river's been a very important part of its life uh, over the yeah, years. Yeah. Um, Doris, I'm going to step back to, and I'm not sure of the date, but you can fill it in, um, on the origins of the uh, Red Deer Community Foundation and how that got started. Uh, I think it was maybe during your time on the museum board. It did. It, it did. Um, well, it was 35 years ago. Uh, now, and it really started, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory to it. It really started with the Ellis Bird Farm, and this was the uh, 
um, Charlie and Winnie Ellis, uh, when Union Carbide had come to central Alberta looking for a place to locate an ethylene glycol plant to make antifreeze and other chemicals, they needed certain land requirements. We already had the Nova Chemicals plant here. Uh, but they needed this other site. And so it was decided by, by uh, the company that they would buy the ranch lands from Charlie and Winnie Ellis, which is east of Black Falls. So they sold this their land, and Charlie and Winnie were a brother and sister who had lived on that ranch all their lives, and they had a, a Charlie had developed a bluebird program where he put out bird boxes to attract the bluebirds because he realized they were a vanishing species. And he and his sister fed truckloads of seed to the birds in the wintertime. It was an amazing operation. Kerry Wood writes about it, refers to Charlie as Mr. Bluebird. And, uh, and, and so on. So when Union Carbide wanted to buy this land, and it was so much tied up with this naturalist theme, and then Ready River naturalists were in great tizzy because they didn't want to see this disturbed. So with the naturalists and Carbide and Charlie and Winnie, they worked out a deal where Carbide would look after the bird feeding operation, and Winnie and, and Charlie would have uh, life privilege to live on the land as long as they wanted. And, uh, and so they formed a limited liability nonprofit company. And I was named as the chairman of the board of that company. And so was the founding chairman for Ellis Bird Farm. A wonderful story of bluebird and cavity nesting bird uh, um, conservation where there's a, an education program and a publication and research program and a beautiful site and so on. It's a very happy story. Carbide has been a continuous provider of about $150,000 a year in basic funding and, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of Carbide coming out of the concern of the Red Deer River naturalists and, and Charlie and Winnie's bird feeding operation. So how does that tie to the community foundation? Well, one day I got a call from Winnie Ellis and she said, Morris, I wonder if you could help us with our money. And I said, well, I'll try. What's, what's the issue? And she said, well, we sold the land and we have all this money and we don't need it. And it's driving us crazy. And they and had it, no family because neither had married. Neither of them had ever married. And she said, it's sitting in the bank after having paid taxes on it. It's sitting in the bank and it's gaining $450 a day interest. Because remember, this is 30 years ago when the interest rate was about 16% at the bank. And so she said, it's driving us crazy. So I went out and talked to them about what the problem was. And I said to myself, I think this is a community foundation in the making because they have to get rid of this money. They want to get rid of this money and they want to do something good with it because they were also of a, uh, of a period where you were responsible for doing responsible things. So I met with them a second time and I proposed to them that I would ask the community if they wanted to start a community foundation. And they said they would like that idea. I said, or you could give it to this or you could give it to that or, you know. And really at that time, I didn't know whether we were talking about $100,000 or whether we were talking about a lot of money. And I called a meeting in Red Deer at the museum on December the 6th. And I thought, oh my goodness, Christmas is coming. People are not gonna wanna come to a meeting. And I invited 66 people and 60 showed up. And I, I said to them very simply, do you want to have a community foundation? I think I have a way of starting one. They all said yes. So I went back to Charlie and Winnie 
and I said, um, we're, we're on for a community foundation. And they said, well, that is wonderful. So with that, Winnie wrote a check for $500,000 and Charlie wrote two checks for $250,000 each. And they threw the checks and the pen across the table and they said, well, that's a relief. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I picked up a million dollars in checks. I'd made arrangements with the Recreation, Alberta Recreation Parks and Wildlife Foundation director that I could park the money there until we got a foundation that could receive it. So I took it up to, he was a teacher from, a former teacher from the high school. And I took it to him and deposited the money uh, that afternoon. But Charlie and Winnie were very wily. They said, this is on two conditions and they're both on you. <laughs> they said, what? That this is anonymous. Is what is anonymous. anonymous. You're not to say where this money came from. And secondly, you have to agree to be the executors to our estates. And I said, well, the first one is tough. The second one is easy. So for about 30 years, I never shared where that money came from. Charlie and Winnie are both gone now. And the only reason they wanted anonymous was number one, they didn't want people coming to them. And secondly, they didn't want the credit. They were very humble people and it had been a, an accident of economics. And so they wanted to do some good. And with the, the initial gift, <clears throat> they sent a $50,000 endowment to the museum. 50,000 to the Carrywood Nature Center, 50,000 to the Medicine Re Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, 50,000 to the CNIB, and 50,000 to the crippled children. And so other than that, there were no restrictions. So we got busy and we started a community foundation. Mark Hicks agreed to be the founding chairman. We got a board together. We got registered as a society we got registered with then it was called revenue Canada. It's called the cra today and ultimately a year later we called back the million dollars from the alberta Histor parks and recreation and wildlife foundation and they said well it's grown to a 1.2 million now and we said well keep twenty thousand for your trouble and send us the rest <laughs> So they did. And that's how the community foundation began with the idea that the community foundation would be the savings account for the community with endowed money and resources where it would go on in perpetuity generating funds to provide seed money and contributions to, to community projects. And so the community foundation is now 40 years old, I suppose, or thereabouts. And the Ellis Bird Farm is now about 40 years old. I know they celebrated their 35th anniversary of the Bird Farm a few years ago. And, uh, and so those two are all tied together. And uh, before Charlie died and left another 800,000 to the foundation. And when Winnie died, I have a, an interesting story. Winnie is in her 90s. She said, I don't know why I'm alive anymore. She said, but I am. And one, one Christmas, I had an opportunity that there was a, a, a funder in Calgary would double match any money that was donated in aid of children's needs. So I wrote a letter to Winnie in my Christmas card to her. And I said, Winnie, if you've got a tax problem, I've got I've got a solution. So I didn't get a Christmas card from her. And I thought, uh oh, I have overstepped the limit. However, just early in the new year, I got a call from her. And she said, Morris, you saved my bacon. I said, how's that? And she said, well, your Christmas letter arrived. And she said, I was thinking I was going to have to rewrite my will. 
because I wanted to make some changes. But she said, if I can get rid of the money ahead of time, I don't have to rewrite the will. <laughs> so she said, come up. So I met her and we talked and she said, hand me my purse. So I handed her a purse and she dug in and she got her, her savings account out, her bank book. And she looked at it like this and the wheels went around in her head and she said, double matched. And I said, yes. And she said, how about 370,000? <laughs> she said, that'll just about clean out my savings account. And I said, well, Winnie, that would make nearly a million dollars because 370 plus double. So we went down to the bank and she signed off the $370,000. And that was her last major contribution. She died a few years later or a few months later than that. But the estate had been largely dissipated by that time. And, and that went to the community foundation too? It went to the community foundation as well. So there was the initial million, Charlie's 800,000, and Winnie's finale at another million. I, I remember some of those early presentations on the concept and uh, was the community interested and willing um, with a, a, a subtle um, a suggestion that there potentially could be a, some significant uh, local money added to it, which, as you said, was anonymous. But I, I remember coming away from that saying, these community foundations are really a, um, a significant reflection of the community, its attitudes, its priorities, uh, what it's willing to do. But the other thing is that the earlier it starts to establish such a foundation, the more money it accumulates. And it, it's remarkably related to time. Um, and that certainly happened with, um, with this foundation. Uh, there are, of course, larger ones, but what, what is the, the um, value of it? Um, it's in excess of 13 million today and it's given out 10 million. <laughs> well, I, I remember uh, when the um, Rotary Club uh, was looking at its uh, 75th anniversary project uh, and came up with the idea of, of establishing a, um, a post high school foundation or fund that would uh, support students with lower family incomes. And um, eventually, um, and perhaps it's the same match because it was somebody from Calgary that agreed to take whatever the Rotary Club put into it and triple it. Yeah, there was a, a donor family. When I say a family, it was more than one family, but it was a group of, of, uh, of benefactors in, in Calgary. And they simply, they had so much money that they banded together and they hired a consultant in an office and they actually distributed money, first of all, throughout Alberta, then to Alberta, BC, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho and Montana, and ultimately across Canada. It was just sheets of money that came. And the only, the only connection I ever saw was one letter went past my desk and it had uh, a Bermuda, not a Bermuda, a Bahamas address on the letterhead. And I thought, yes, we have some offshore money here and it's just pouring in. And, and nothing seemed to impede them. They, they had money to do absolutely everything. I have no idea who it was, but um, it, was, uh, it was greatly helpful to the Community Foundation because there were many instances where that group from Calgary provided matching money and startup money for the foundation, especially to look after the operating costs of the foundation. And of course, one of the current goals of the foundation is to add enough money to an endowment to cover the operating costs completely. Mm -hmm. So that when you give a dollar to the foundation, it stays there. Nobody's going to say, well, we have to take 17 cents from that for the operation. The other interesting thing is um, both Hazel and I have been involved with the um, United Way. I was chairman one year, years ago for the, uh, for the funding campaign. And we characterized the United Way as the checking account 
which is renewed every year by the campaign and supports community groups and efforts. And the foundation is the savings account. In other words, that money is never paid out. It goes into, an, it. well, most of it is endowed, which means it stays forever. And it just spins off earnings that can be used at the discretion of the board. Mm -hmm. So, And the foundation, the community foundation is clearly to me one of the most rewarding and singularly satisfying projects that I've been involved in founding. Ellis Bird Farm was fun, but the foundation was really serious business. And to know that it's contributed $10 million to the Red Deer area. And I spent a great deal of time helping other communities spawn the foundation. So we've got, there's a Sylvan Lake fund within our foundation, a Lacombe fund, an Innisfail fund, uh, an Olds fund within the community foundation so that they don't have to all have separate community foundations. And uh, I founded, I was the founding speaker to get the Brooks one going and the one in Crow's Nest Pass and the one in Banff the one in Grand Prairie, I think. <laughs> but are they through the Red Deer one, or did you just no, use the template? they're all separate. They used yeah. the, the template. And we used the Calgary template. Uh, Calgary has just gone great guns. Uh, and it was in a, in a period of revival. They, Calgary and Edmonton Foundations were started in the 50s. And Calgary's kind of continued because it had that American oil patch mentality that that worked wonders but they 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 were in just in the process of really gunning it up edmonton's had become moribund for years and they have revived theirs in the last 30 years and it has just grown hugely as well because there is an enormous intergenerational transfer of wealth with just the value of land alone in alberta and the oil industry and so on and so there have been huge fortunes made uh, accidentally by people and uh, the Tim's uh, family from from Erskine is a good example of that where Tim's Mr. Tim's uh, left four million dollars for to the University of Alberta to have a building named after him and uh, his wife was to follow suit However, when the University of Alberta didn't get going very fast on doing anything, Mrs. Timms rewrote her will and left half of her estate to the hospital here in Red Deer and half to Red Deer College. And uh, unfortunately, that was contested by the University of Alberta and their only daughter, and it eventually led to a settlement, a Red Deer College. I don't know what they did with their money. I suspect it went into scholarships. And at the hospital here, <clears throat> they they had a, an endowment and they began to nibble away at it to, uh, to uh, support the um, chaplaincy program. And I got wind of this and I said, well, you can't nibble away at an endowment or pretty soon you don't have one and then you're out on your ear. And the chaplaincy program is a very important program. So I raised this with the people at the hospital and they said, well, yes, that's true. And I said, well, how be we get busy and raise the money to make this endowment big enough that you can leave it alone and it'll, it'll be in perpetuity. So the challenge for me and a couple of other people who helped me in the fundraising, including Hazel, uh, was to raise money for the development of an interfaith chapel and a beautiful meditative garden at the hospital and to put the, the chaplaincy program on a, on a funded basis. So we raised 1.2 million, I think, for that uh, in various things with great deal of help from the women, from the uh, volunteer association at the hospital. They, they kicked off with $500,000 right away. And um, the, the hospital changed its tune and put the chaplaincy program as a line in its budget. And we built the interfaith chapel and the, uh, and the um, 
the meditative garden space. Um, yes, I remember all those steps and introducing them to the Foothills Hospital in, in Calgary. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was important because what, what fueled me on that was I said, look, I can't raise any money for a chaplaincy program unless you can show me medical people that the chaplaincy program has some real value. And so they cited a study that was done in, in New York State with heart patients. And the study showed that the, or the study had two groups. One group got one visit from a chaplain while they were in hospital following heart surgery or heart attack. And the other group got a daily visit from a chaplain. And the difference between the two the two uh, groups was that the people who had daily visits from chaplains left the hospital on the average of three days earlier, used fewer medications, called on hospital staff fewer times. And I said, if you can save three hospital days from every patient, that's worth it. So we will do this project. And that's the way I convinced some of the hard-nosed people that they had to give money to this project. That's interesting because in Calgary we um, took leaders and uh, philosophical and, and articulate leaders in that field and we would bring them in for major conferences. And I so well remember a lady by the name of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross yes. um, coming to Calgary to talk about death and dying and the stages that involved right at the very beginning of, of you know the publication of her book and, and the, um, the uh, response that it received, because uh, it, it almost gave an outline, an organization, and a purpose to that, to that field. Um, well, as we um, you know, progress to, uh, the, <laughs> I'm not sure progress is the right way <laughs> right for it. We, we, could, we could tell stories all day, but um, after um, your period as mayor and so on, you retired, but that isn't a, a word in your vocabulary. Um, what were some of the things that you either picked up um, or um, carried on with uh, after you um, uh, retired from civic politics? Well, I, th I think before we, we launch into that, one of the things that needs to be said is that Hazel and I worked as a team in most of these cases. One of us might be the leader or the figurehead, but underneath it, there, there was a commitment of both of us because you can't lead a very active life in the community in volunteer service. Somebody has to stay home and stir the stew. And, and so while Hazel might have been doing one thing, I would pull back on another or vice versa. And, and uh, I was employed almost all the time. Uh, Hazel left regular employment due to, her, uh, due to her illness about 25 years ago, but that did not stop her from, from, from being, being active. So, and I think another comment that Hazel would make is that being a politician's wife is a full-time job too, because uh, part of that is keeping your lips zipped, and part of it is being sort of neutral and accommodating. Not having an opinion. <laughs> the third part is the entertainment and maintaining your friendships and relationships. Yeah, yeah there's a, there was a lot of social. When I was mayor, uh, Hazel and I, or I, uh, very often with Hazel, was invited to 750 events a year. And when you think of 750 that's events, two a day, yeah, and and uh, and that that's that takes takes a huge commitment. So what did we do after we after we left the mayor's office? Well, uh, the the ranch continued, uh, but I became in, involved in uh, in working with the indigenous people. Uh, somewhere along the way, uh, the indigenous people and and my interest in them and my support of them kind of 
wound its way through a whole lot of things, starting with my grandmother, who was a great friend of the indigenous people, and Hazel's work at Masquachis, and Ethel Taylor's with the Cultural College at Masquachis, and and uh, and so on and so forth. And as the mayor, I realized that we have a mayor and council for the city, and that on each reserve there is a chief and council sometimes elected, sometimes hereditary, but they organized this way. But we had a lot of indigenous people living in Red Deer and they did not have a clear voice as an indigenous group. So I didn't know how this was going to be dealt with at all. So, but I felt we needed to, we needed to kind of explore some possibilities. So I contacted the chiefs of the six bands in our area, uh, the four from Masquachis, Sanchado and Ochis, and uh, invited them to just share uh, their thoughts about how we might do some governance together. Because I said, look, when I have an issue that involves Lacombe, I phone the mayor of Lacombe. I know who the mayor of Lacombe is. I know who the mayor of Pinocchio is, and I can call him or her or the county reeve. If it came to Hobiba or Basquachis, I wouldn't have a clue who to call. Or for Rocky Mountain House, if it was beyond Rocky Mountain House, I wouldn't have a clue who to call out there. So they agreed that we, some of them responded, and there was couple of meetings held. But I said, in the meantime, I think I will convene the elders in the community here. And using the word convene reminds me of another piece of being mayor. Now, I'll just divert on that for just a second, if, if I may. As mayor, you have one vote and some influence, but really you're a member of a council and you're chairman of that council but you don't really have any singular power. But the power that you do have as mayor is you have the power to convene. When the mayor invites you to a meeting, you come. So if I were to invite 10 people to a meeting as the mayor, I usually got 10 people. And, and so I thought, well, I'll talk to the elders and convene the elders in the community because they are the people who are the knowledge keepers and the cultural keepers for the community. So I called them together and I said, I don't know what we're going to do with this meeting, but I think we should meet regularly and I think we should have items that need discussion from an Aboriginal standpoint or a First Nation standpoint and the city standpoint. And this is the starting point. And so we met for four or five times a year at noon hour. Um, we didn't have agendas. Agendas just came out of what was on people's minds and on their hearts. And um, um, we, there, there was also the movement of foot of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the recommendations that that uh, and in the the more uh, the rise of the First Nations people in 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 this area, and so out of that came the the fact that we had met and we were looking for ways of governance. The province came up with an idea that we should develop First Nations councils within, within uh, municipalities. And out of that, Alberta, Grand Prairie, and Edmonton were the three communities. Red Deer, Grand Prairie, and Edmonton were the three communities in Alberta that the province felt should pilot this. And so we did develop a system 
of First Nations government called the Urban Aboriginal Voices in Red Deer here, modeled on one that Edmonton had developed a little bit ahead of us and working on indigenous housing, uh, employment, education, youth, elders, cultural uh, uh, accommodation and, and so on. And so we have a very active now urban Aboriginal voices group in town that supports and, and helps uh, the city council and city council vice versa um, in, in governance issues relating to the indigenous people. And of course, there's the Red Deer Native Friendship Center, which offers direct assistance to the, the, the uh, native people. So I've been involved in a lot of indigenous um, development in the community, which was, which was moving along very nicely with uh, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. And indeed, I was a an honorary witness at hearings in Red Deer for the Truth and Recreation, Re, Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, during my time as mayor. And uh, we annually have a spring feast. And on my birthday in 19, on my birthday when I was 71 in 1912, or, uh, 2012, I was um, I was asked if I would accept an honorary name uh, from the um, local indigenous community, and indeed that's when I received my headdress at a naming ceremony at the spring feast, and that was tied in with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, uh, cooperation with the uh, Red Deer Indian Industrial School and the history of that, um, where we identified all of the students who'd gone to the industrial school here, and we invited all their families from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba to come and join the feast. And it, there, there have been a number of really important things that have that have happened. That's other become that. a national. Yeah. Precedent, so. Yeah. And and we set up an organization called the Remembering the Children Society. And it is a prototype for um, honoring children who went to the industrial school and many who lost their lives there. And in Red Deer, we have um, we have four of the grave markers from the industrial school cemetery are now in the museum and at the red deer cemetery during the 1918 flu epidemic the, everyone at the school was ill including the staff and four teenagers died and there was nobody that could do anything by way of preparing the bodies or burying them. And so the principal called the funeral director in Red Deer and said, come get these bodies and bury them in Red Deer at the cemetery. And a hundred years later, we, the Remembering the Children's Society put a monument with their names on, they were identified. And we put their names on the, uh, the uh, what do you see? Oh, it's just a mail van. Uh, on the memorial stone, the names are there, and the story of the Red Deer Industrial School is there as well. Because unfortunately, the Red Deer Industrial School here had the poorest health record of any of the industrial sco or Indian schools in in Canada, and uh, and so uh, we had a very high mortality rate. Now. The good news is the province has bought the land where the cemetery was located, and it's in the process of being um, developed and, and marked and and uh, commemorated. Um, perhaps we can almost close on that one. Uh, well, there is one thing I think you you should mention is your work with Phil Fontaine. I think uh, this is. I think that's important because that goes back many, many years. Well, thirty years ago, um, well, 1988, when the Calgary Olympics was on, uh, Glenbow 
launched a major exhibition called Where the Spirit Sings. And it was to honor the in indigenous populations of Canada. And they did their best, but they fell short of the mark. And there were huge protests in Calgary. It went to Ottawa and there were even more protests in Ottawa. I was president of the Canadian Museums Association at the time. And Phil Fontaine was the Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. So Phil and I co-convened a conference in Ottawa on museums and indigenous people and artifacts and we had 400 people attend and out of that came the protocols of how museums should handle museum art, art uh, indigenous artifacts their stories the programming and the spirituality surrounding it and those protocols came out of that meeting were adopted across the nation and in the u.s and adopted by unesco and used throughout the world. And tw about 25 years later, I went to a conference in Kelowna, sponsored by the Royal British Columbia Museum in the province of British Columbia, to look at the repatriation of artifacts from the various museums. And it, for two and a half days, we focused only on what was happening. And it's really, really wonderful because one of the one of the protocols was, if you have material that doesn't belong to your museum, it should go back to the indigenous people. And this particularly includes bodies, because at bodies. bodies. At the turn of the century, there was a great debate about which race was the superior race, yellow, white, black, or red. And there was much anthropological work being done with skull measurements and body measurements and so on and so forth. And so skeletons were collected by museums in great numbers. And so there was a, a memorable movie has been made of the Field Museum in Chicago. And they decided that they were going to return all the uh, the body, the bones, to the West Coast Indian people on the, uh, the Charlottes. And so the delegation from the Charlottes, the Haida people came down and visited the museum. And it was a very trying time for some of them because some of the people recognized the names of their grandparents on the end of these bankers boxes full of bones that had been just held by the museum from the 1880s or 90s. And, and so Air Canada agreed to fly all the remnants, remnants back to, to Haida. And what they did was they did the ceremonial piece where the, the remains the human remains in, in the Field Museum were identified. And then the people went back to Haida Gwaii and they, they, they made the traditional bent wood boxes with the beautiful decorations on them. And the school children took red or black cloth and sewed on the white pearl buttons that is so typical of the decoration of the Haida and Kwakatiel people. And then when each of the banker's boxes of bones was brought, they used the blanket to wrap, the school children's blanket to wrap the, the bones and set them in the box. And they were all ceremonially buried. And I believe 500 came back. Morris, I don't really want to end on that, quite on that note. But um, it is just reminding me of how many stories of the two of you have and of course i've been privileged to share share them <laughs> on many occasions here and i, I think the um, bottom line and, and um, i'm i'm really hopeful that uh, some red deer people who've been in red deer a long time will do more than just um, enjoy an interview but will uh, 
put pen to paper, as, as Earl Scarlett would say, and, and uh, extend the project into a, a more, a longer, more meaningful, more thought out, perhaps a, a story, memoir, or even a book. Uh, so I, I encourage you to uh, pick up the threads. Uh, and I, I think, because there's so many. There are many that, threads. Uh, <laughs> there are many threads. I actually like, was, I actually was responding. I realized, I thought to myself, how did I get down this rabbit hole? And then I thought to myself, the question he asked me was, what am I doing now? Well, and, okay. and, and what I was going to tell you was that yeah. I've been working with a, a group that are forming a national institute on nature's law and, and, and uh, indigenous law and it is it is taking off in ways that are absolutely amazing and it will become an international institution of study of nature's laws so yes i'm still working on all of that and uh, um, i work slower now <laughs> well, but just have to um yeah. Prioritize it. Perhaps. Yes. Yes. Anyway, but I I, I, I hear I what you're saying. Strongly encourage you. Um, there are one or two people that I I, I have raised the same thought with, um, and realized over time that um, one of the problems is that it's a never end. It it isn't the story that ends, and and in some ways it's hard to look at it because it never ended. But you can also do the opposite, which is to go back and say, well. How did it begin and how did it evolve? Well, and, so. and, and just as we sat here conversationally to some degree, one thing leads to another and it, it's a network. It isn't linear. It's, it's a network of things that, that, that occur. And it's a network of people you become involved with. I mean, the people that Hazel and I have met, we were in preparation for this, we were talking about, Sir Tyrone Guthrie came to Red Deer one time ostensibly to help us with Central Alberta Theatre coming up with an idea of building a theatre before it was ex agreed that the Memorial Centre was acceptable and that the Arts Centre would be built. This was way back in uh, about 1970, I'm sure. And Sir Tyrone Guthrie came here and we toured him around Red Deer and showed him sights and he chatted with us and had dinner with us. Did he have dinner with us? I believe so, yes. Yeah. And, and I mean, in those days, having Sir Tyrone Guthrie here was big news. There you go. I mean, it was just a little like that. It never amounted to anything, but it was part of the exercise. The art center in, at Red Deer College is the, is the fruit of that, ultimately. You, you could have a chapter in your book called Dinner at the Flewellings. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was oh, another oh. <laughs> one. We, we did all these fundraising dinners to, to support groups and so on, because we love to do the dinners and, and so on. And Hazel said we did 40. We have done 40 of these things. And I mean, they were major opus were major. and uh, raised thousands of dollars for, for but uh, they were just something that you just, you just did because I would go to these silent auctions and I thought, well, what have we got to put in a silent auction? You know, we don't have any product. And then, so we then started modestly with dinners and we ended up immodestly because some of them sold for nearly $6,000. I think the last the last major one we had was $6,500, and it was out on the back deck, and we had eight people working in the kitchen. Well, we had eight people helping us because we used to do them alone. But then, <laughs> then as we got older, we couldn't do them alone. But then we would have musicians come in, uh, a flautist uh, or a cellist, uh, or a violinist, and uh, these would very often be uh, musicians that had gone to Red Deer College, then had moved away, were in Edmonton. They would come down, and uh, again, young students, young students, and we would blend this. Blend this anyway, but one of the challenges of that kind of a project is to find appropriate pictures to go with it. So. 
when you come to the chapter on dinners at the Fluellen. We have so pictures I, of all the settings, and we have pictures of all the dinners. Well, <laughs> one of my favorites is the one that uh, was taken of Mother and W. O. Mitchell. Yes. 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 And that's the only picture that exists of the two of them. And oh their my. friendship that goes back so far and how it underlays the huge mural at the uh, Curling Club. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the, in the, in the yeah. name of mother and dad, but of uh, the Black Bond spell. But um, your mother and dad were the elders in the community that we patterned which Morris and I looked for inspiration. And you know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because your mother and dad and that crowd were a, a, a oh. bunch of real developers in Red Deer. And we were the youngest people in that crowd, and we're the only the ones left. But they showed us the path to take, and so uh, the community owes them a great debt because we learned from them. We watched, and they instructed us, and uh, they provided such a wonderful example. True. Well, it was certainly a. Um, um, marvelous opportunity, I guess, to contribute that um, kept mother and dad in Red Deer instead of moving to Calgary as they had originally intended. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, it, you know, as I um, struggle with trying to um, put something together on the 100 years of the Rotary Club, which mm -hmm. comes up next year, um, I'm back into those early stories and, and, and I, I'm amazed. Um, I mean, uh, either People one of them or both of them could have belonged to five clubs at once. Oh. Um, and I always remember Dad saying, well, I joined that one because this one wasn't active enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But well, it is a, a reflection of the, um, you know, you, you, when you bring together a mass of people of that, which have a, perhaps not stated but, or written, but at least a common goal to improve the community, it's amazing that... Well, one of, one, of, one of the things that we might have explored is the changes that have occurred. And the one thing, one of the big changes I noticed is now that the, that the businesses in Red Deer are no longer locally owned. They're not the entrepreneurial work of some couple like Bob and Doris Jewel or your mom and dad mm -hmm. or, or some of the other people like Horsley's or uh, Holmes's and, and all these people who who developed these businesses. They're now part of chains and we now don't yeah. have local managers and, and so on and so forth. Anyway. Well, and, and, and the re even the earlier uh, facet of that was the high turnover of very good people yeah. that came to Red Deer and you knew they wouldn't be here more than four years, usually two, and then they would leave. And it was so hard to get things like the United Way started. Um, anyway, that's, uh, you're right. Um, I'll, I'll think about that as another interview, but uh, I can't say thank you enough. As it's just, our pleasure. I've learned oh, a lot. Um, great fun. Um, you filled in a number of holes and, and brought back, of course, lots of memories. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, um, I do hope that you'll carry on to that next step. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, we've got scribbled notes, and uh, and Hazel's Hazel's uh, resume is, is still a work in progress. Well, I, I was thinking of the Red Deer. It was a cultural capital that it was it received an award for, and brought Adriana Clarkson and John Ralston all here, and I. Um, I think they're running out of time on their memory. I think so. so. I think we're, um, but we're I, likely I, I done. I had wanted to mention, you know, quickly mention that, but they're, yeah. I mean, as your list, once your list has doubled. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. I'll have Morris uh, tape it up and there, or uh, put it on the computer and you can have a look.